Well, you're turning to Luke 7, and if you don't have a Bible and want to follow along, there's plenty at the carts by both doors. Um, this summer, uh, my wife and I were blessed uh, by my wife's family uh, to be able to take uh, three of our four kids to Disney World for the first time. Don't tell the little one, okay? So uh, the two-year-old stayed home, but uh, three of the four, and part of what was fun about that trip was we were able to keep it a secret from them the entire time until we got to Florida, um, which I thought was going to be tricky because we had told them all year uh, we're going to a family reunion in Tennessee, and this will be an opportunity for you to see relatives you've never seen before. And I thought the four hours we spent in Georgia would be a problem, okay, just on that drive. And it, uh, when we hit Atlanta, my 10-year-old asked, where are we going? And I gave her something about how this is the part of Georgia, you kind of have to dip down through here, and then you get back into Tennessee, and it worked, okay? She wasn't looking at a map, so she was fine. Uh, and we got to surprise them, and we got there. But going into that trip, I'll just be honest, some of my dad anxiety uh, was running pretty high because it was four days, four different parks, closed to finish in the middle of June in Florida. So everything inside of me as a dad was saying, okay, it's going to be some work. So we did it. It was good. The third day we were trying to stay uh, from the opening of the park to the close. It hit three or four in the afternoon. Everybody was just a little tired. It was hot. We were uh, needing a little bit of a break. They'd been eating snacks out of a backpack all day. And so I thought I'll let me be the hero for a minute, and I'll make dinner reservations for everybody. For 10 of us, and I got on the app secretly, and someone had canceled a reservation, so I was able to get into this nice restaurant at the park and make a reservation for 10 at dinner time. And I was excited, and I announced to the group, hey, we've got a dinner reservation. You know, everything's going to be great. We're going to be able to kill a few hours in the air conditioning. Perfect. Then my wife started to cautiously ask me some questions that one would ask before doing something like I had done. Hey, did you look at the prices on the dinner menu? Yeah, it's fine. Hey, do they have a kid's menu? Yes, they have a kid's menu. It's fine. Which is true if you go for lunch. And I discovered this because on the train to a different part of the park, my wife's face is white, and I start getting some text. Hey, did you know at dinner it's an all-you-can-eat buffet for everybody? Perfect. That sounds awesome. Oh, it boiled down to a few minutes of text that ended with, we will spend the rest of the money we had budgeted for this trip, plus mortgage our house for us to be able to eat this dinner with everybody. And then I saw the amount, and I began to have second thoughts. Here's the problem, though. At Disney, and I knew this, you can't cancel a dinner reservation within 24 hours of eating there or pay a fee that's basically the same amount as having to eat there. So I thought... We might as well eat, we might as well enjoy it, but eventually my uh, desire to avoid trying to talk this person out of our reservation won, and so on the train I called, I finally explained the situation to the guy, and he said, you know, you know, you didn't cancel in 24 hours, you're going to be free, yes, I know, you really should have checked the menu before, yeah, I know, and then kind of quietly off to the side, my wife was trying to surprise us, and she didn't look at the menu, and I'm just trying to help us out here, and so, and <laughs> didn't do it. Okay. Thought about it. Didn't do it. <laughs> but after a few minutes of talking, get to this place where he finally said, look, I said, well, we've got kids and they're tired. Uh, I'll waive it. No fee. No reservation. Just, and he gave me advice. Normally, you don't. Just be more careful when you make dinner reservations. And I was like, I, oh, from now on, yes, I will. And there was Disney's a magical place, and that was the most magical moment of my Disney experience when he said, just, it's taken care of. Don't worry about it. Maybe you've had an experience where someone took care of a debt that you owed, a payment you had to make, uh, a situation you debt yourself. It was a medical bill. Someone stepped in and helped with it. Uh, maybe it was, honestly, you were just in a place in life where uh, things were tight and someone paid a utility. Someone helped out with rent. Uh, maybe you owed someone money and someone gave you uh, some cash to help out with that. That when you have this uh, a debt weighing on you that you can't pay or are struggling to pay or is going to be more than you can pay and someone takes care of it, maybe you've had the experience in that moment of how freeing it is to know kind of the slate has been wiped clean in that way. And I bring this up because in our text this morning, the exact same thing happens for a woman in a spiritual sense in Luke chapter 7. Luke 7, 36, we're going to get into this text. We read, one of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. Now, as we get into this, we don't know why the Pharisee invited Jesus to dinner, but it wasn't uh, uncommon for 
If you had a, a, a rabbi or a teacher come to your town and he was preaching, that the people who lived in that city would provide meals and a place to stay, and this is kind of what you did. So this is the situation Jesus was in. And the, the hostility between Jesus and the religious leaders wasn't running so hot yet. And so this man invites Jesus in. Now, there's something a little uncommon about these meals, very different from the meals that we share today. And what was uncommon was this. The front door would be left open at meals where a prominent guest was, which meant anybody could come in and watch the people eat their dinner together. You couldn't have any dinner. But you could sit on the outside and listen in on the conversation and be close to this person who had visited your city. And it was, I mean, there was nothing better to do in the first century. So people go watch other people eat. Now, while this is happening, a woman takes advantage of this and walks in the room. Nothing odd about that. However, when this particular woman walked in the room, my guess is there would have been a lot of raised eyebrows at who had come in. Because as we read Luke 7, 37 to 38, behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner. How would you love that as the tagline for you? Okay, so a woman of the city who was a sinner. She had learned that Jesus was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. And so uh, this woman makes her way into the house, makes her way up to Jesus, uh, and very quickly this scene begins to play out where she begins to, uh, as we read, anoint Jesus' feet with oil. Now, we're told by Luke this woman was a sinner, which likely means, it's not definite, likely she was a prostitute. If not, there was something so morally objectionable about her that Luke could use the description, she was a sinner and people would be tracking with him. And as she comes in, again, the guests are probably thrown off by the fact that she would walk into this formal meal with Jesus, and yet the scene that, uh, that begins to play out actually would have offended them even more than her just coming into the room. Again, we read, she bends down to anoint Jesus' feet with oil, which was this perfume that you would use uh, on someone's feet. But as she does this, she begins to cry, and her tears hit Jesus', hit Jesus feet. And she begins to wipe the tears with her hair. And that act in and of itself, just reading this, it doesn't sound that scandalous. The fact that she would let her hair down in front of other men would have been incredibly offensive to the religious leaders. You find in later Jewish tradition that some rabbis taught if a woman let her hair down in public, it was grounds for divorce from her husband because only her husband should see her in that way. So it's not just this woman has come into this dinner. It's not just that she's a prostitute, but now she's let her hair down. She's crying. She's making a scene that she's just doing. Uh, we read the last description of this. She's kissing Jesus' feet over and over. And Luke paints this picture of a woman just completely overcome by and overwhelmed with emotion and love for Jesus. And there are people sitting around the table watching this take place who are incredibly offended by everything that she's done. Now, as I read this text this week, I found myself asking a question that kind of unsettled me a little bit. When have I ever felt this strongly about Jesus? Again, not that I respond in the, uh, the specific way she did. I'm wiping no one's feet with my hair, okay? So I'm just, that's not happening, but it'll take a while to get there. But why did she have this overwhelming love for Jesus that comes out in a way where it's obvious she doesn't care about anyone else in that room other than Jesus? And she pours out love for him. And she, she just wants to be close to him and, and serve him. How she, she, just, she wants to show Jesus how appreciative she is of him. And as I thought back about my own life, I was struggling to think of instances where I felt like, when have I been overcome and overwhelmed by love for Jesus like this to the point where I didn't care who was in the room, I didn't care who was with me or who saw it, but I just I had to, to worship Jesus in a way that just kind of came out of me. And so oh, what that left me with was this. If I feel like that's lacking in my life, what keeps me from loving Jesus in that way? Why does it feel like my, my love for Jesus has uh, grown cold in a sense? Maybe you're here this morning and you're having the thought like, I want to love Jesus more, but I'm just not feeling it right now. It's difficult that there are times where it's just, it's just hard for me to express love for Jesus and it not feel forced. And the question that we're left with is, 
what keeps people who profess faith in Christ from loving Jesus in a deep way? And Luke 7 is going to answer that question for us. But before we get to the, the answer to the question, I want to look at one other thing. Because in verse 39, we see Simon, who's the Pharisee, his response to this. Now, when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. Now, he raises two issues here, the first being this, and I want it to be clear. Luke tells us he thought this to himself. He didn't say this out loud. He thought it to himself. One, if this man were a prophet, the implied answer to that question is no, he's not. In the way that he said it, he's implying if he were a prophet, he wouldn't let this woman touch him, and because he's letting her touch him, he's not a prophet. And the second issue being, he would have known what sort of woman this was, being a sinner, a sinful woman. And again, we want to ask, why was it such a big deal for this woman to touch Jesus? Well, the assumption that many religious leaders had in the first century was, sin was not something to just avoid personally. It's not just, I want to keep from sinning. It's, I want to keep sinful things away from me, including other people. So it's not just, I want to make sure I'm not doing sinful things. I don't want to get too close to sinful people because if I do, they'll kind of rub their sin off on me. It's like when I, I love when my kids want to be close to me. Hugging and snuggling and our two-year-old from uh, somewhere between 1 and 3 a.m. the last couple weeks has just gotten in this habit, climbs out of his crib, gets in between Jesse and I. Everything inside of me wants to tell him to go back to bed, and then he buries his head in my chest and just kind of curls up, and it's wonderful for like five minutes, and then I just wish he'd leave, but I can't make him leave. And so, but there's one moment, and it's usually we're at a wedding where I love my kids, and I want them to know that I love them. But I don't want them to touch me at a wedding because they're usually filthy. We sit down for dinner, everybody's in fancy clothes, and there's food on their face and their hands and their clothes. And all of a sudden, I'm, if, especially if I'm doing the wedding, I'm in a, a white shirt and I don't have to be in front of people. And without fail, one of them will run up to me, arms outstretched, marinara sauce on their hands and face. And they're just coming at me. And I'm able to hopefully catch them by the hands and kind of keep them here. And you got to let them know you care about them without letting them get close. And it's, I love you. This is great. We kind of dance like this, making sure they're like a full body length away from me. And it's, it's a tricky thing to let someone, I care about you, but don't get close to me. But I've kind of perfected it at this point. And so uh, that was the posture the religious people of Jesus' day took toward people they considered sinful. I know I'm supposed to care about you. I want you to know I care about you. Don't get close to me. Because if you do, you're going to rub your filth off on me. And that's what this woman dealt with pretty much her entire life, being told, don't come into the temple. Don't come into certain parts of the city. Don't be around holy people. Don't get too close to us because we don't want you to get your sin on us. And so she has spent her entire life being told by religious people, don't come near us. And yet she's introduced to Jesus and his teaching and his ministry. And what does she find from Jesus? Not you need to stay at arm's length, but Someone who will embrace her and receive her and invite her in and and who will offer her forgiveness and grace and mercy and love. And as you begin to put the puzzle pieces together, you begin to understand why this woman was so overcome by emotion toward Jesus. This is the first religious person who ever gave her the idea, you you can be in a relationship with God. She thought that was just, uh, that was done. What was in her background, the things she had done, the things she, she thought there was no chance God would ever want someone like me, and yet she meets Jesus, and Jesus' message to her is, God wants people exactly like you, and she's just overcome by this idea that she thought was an impossibility. I thought I had no hope to be right with God, and Yet Jesus invites her in, and again, when you begin to put yourself in those shoes, you understand why she felt such deep, profound love for Jesus. Now, as we look at this, I, I want to look at how Jesus responds to something, because here's what Jesus does. The thoughts that this Pharisee had about this moment, Jesus responds to them. Think about how unsettling that would be at dinner. You think something, you don't say it, and then someone at the table begins to respond to the thing that you thought, okay? So he's dealing with this, and here's Jesus' response. 
Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money holder had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other owed 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. And as we look at this, the details of this story are not too difficult to understand. Two people owed a debt. One owed a debt comparable to two months' worth of salary. One owed a debt comparable to a year and a half worth of salary. And Jesus says, if both of those are just wiped away, if both of those are just taken care of, who will appreciate it more? Obviously, the person who had the greater debt. If you owed someone 20 bucks and a friend loaned you 20 bucks to take care of it, you'd appreciate it. If you got home after church today and found a letter in the mail, which you forgot about it because the mail doesn't run on Sunday, but you found a letter in the mail and it said, hey, tuition's covered for four years. Hey, the house is paid off. Okay? You're going to be more excited about that than the person who loaned you 20 bucks. That's the, it's, it's an obvious point Jesus is making. Now he drives it home, verse 44. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little, and he said to her, your sins are Forgiven. Jesus reminds Simon, when I showed up to your house, you gave me none of the common courtesy someone does a dinner guest. My guess is for most of you, if someone came over for dinner, there's a few things you just automatically do. Can I take your coat? Would you like something to drink? Would you like an appetizer before the meal served? Just things we do to make people feel welcome. In the first century, it was things like offering, greeting someone with a kiss, offering to wash someone's feet because they walked to your house through filthy roads with sandals on. Things like anointing someone with oil, as Jesus mentions here. And again, Jesus tells this Pharisee, you did none of this for me, but this woman exceeded what she should have done, did more than she was expected to do. And the reason Jesus gives for this, we find in verse 47, her sins which are forgiven, which where many are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Now, don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying she is forgiven because she loved much. And if you look at the second phrase, you see what Jesus is thinking in both scenarios. He's saying the fact that she loved so much is evidence that she's been forgiven much, just like the fact that Simon loved Jesus little is evidence that he thinks he's been forgiven little. And again, why did this woman love Jesus so much? Why did she put on this display at this meal? Because she realized the magnitude of what Jesus was saying. If he's forgiving my sins, which are so great, which have been a part of my life for so many years, that she understood just how big of a debt this was that Jesus was wiping away. Again, she never would have dreamed she could be in a relationship with God, and yet Jesus is inviting her in, regardless of what was in her background, regardless of the, the list of sins she had committed. She could be a part of the family of God, something she never thought possible. She was given a lifeline, and she took it as quickly as she could. And this was common in Jesus' ministry. When you look at who responded to Jesus and his teaching, often it's not the religious leaders. Often it's people who are considered sinners and outcasts and, and worthless people who respond in the greatest numbers. And the question we want to ask is why did they respond in so many numbers so passionately to what Jesus was offering? Philip Yancey tells this story in his book, What Good is God?, about being invited to speak at a conference that focused on ministry to women and prostitution. And he talked with his wife, and he decided to do this as long as he would have an opportunity to, to have a discussion with some of the women and hear their stories as a part of it. He, said, uh, he writes, at the end of the conversation, he had the following, uh, at the end of the uh, convention, he had the following conversation with a woman. I had time for one more question, and he asked, did you know that Jesus referred to your profession? Let me read what he said. I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. He was speaking to religious authorities, and Yancey asked, what do you think Jesus meant? Why did he single out prostitutes here? Yancey writes, after several minutes of silence, a young woman from Eastern Europe spoke up in broken English. 
Everyone has someone to look down on, not us. We are at the low. Our families are ashamed of us. No mother uh, looks at her little girl and says, honey, when you grow up, I want you to be a good prostitute. Most places were breaking the law. Believe me, we know how people feel about us. People call us names. We feel it too. We are at the bottom. And sometimes when you're at the bottom, you cry out for help. So when Jesus comes, we respond. Maybe Jesus meant that. That's a good summary of what Jesus meant. Because what we discover is this, again, people who are forgiven much, love much, people who have had a great debt paid respond in, in, in big ways. And again, this leads us back to a question, or just a personal question for me. So why do I still struggle to show so much love for Jesus? Why do I feel like I've rarely had the kind of experience described in the story? Why am I not more thankful at my core to Jesus for what he's done for me? If I'm being honest, and I think if a lot of us are being honest, those of us who grew up in the church and who have always been around religious things and grew up in a good home and were in youth group and have read the Bible and we pray and we, we're in a small group and we serve, that maybe it's this. If you pressed us, it's not a uh, part of our struggle is deep down we really don't feel like we've been forgiven for much because we didn't need it. That if you really begin to press on me or somebody, again, who, who's had this kind of religious upbringing, upbringing, it's not that we don't think Jesus is unwilling or unable to forgive us, but the reality is we really don't think we're that bad. Kent Hughes sums it up well in his commentary on Luke. Why do many Christians show so little love for Christ? Because they've never truly seen what great sinners they are. And then how sure, sweet, and complete Christ's forgiveness is. The modern American church is filled with people, myself included, who find it easy to think some combination of things about themselves. You know what? I'm generally a pretty moral person. I'm respectable. I'm nice. I don't do offensive things. I don't go places I shouldn't go. I don't say things I shouldn't say. I'm, I give of my money. I do religious things that I'm expected to do that if you just really caught a person in an honest moment, maybe the thought they would have is, for lack of a better term, I, I'm good. I'm a good person. And as we begin to teach, well, what is, what's the effect that has on a relationship with God? I want to be careful how I say this, but it's something that I needed to hear, and my guess is it's something a few people in here need to hear as well. There are some who will be separated from God and experience the judgment of hell, and what will keep them from Jesus isn't a crime, an affair, a lie, alcohol, partying, fill in the blank with whatever it is you think is going to keep someone from God. That there are some who will never respond to Jesus' offer of grace, not because they think they're undeserving, but because deep down they don't really think they need it. We're going to try and get some religious people saved today. Because it's possible to have spent years in the church to know Bible answers to questions, but to never have come to a place where you've personally said, I am a sinner deserving of the judgment of God, in need of the grace of God, and without the help of Jesus, I'm dead in my sin. It's possible to, to be in a church for years and never have that moment. We see this. Jerry Cook says Jesus never attacked the sinner. He simply said, I forgive you. Meanwhile, he attacked the self-righteous with a vengeance because he knew that until they felt guilty, they could not be forgiven. That the church is filled with people who could tell you the gospel, who sing songs, who take communion, but have never felt, I need to be forgiven. I need Jesus to save me. Jesus had to go to the cross for my sin. And there's reasons this is so hard to see, but the main reason I think it's so hard to see is this, and we see it in the Pharisee here. As long as you define your holiness and goodness by comparing yourself to other people, you'll always feel good about who you are. Because he looked at this woman and said, I'm not like that. I'm not a sinner like that. I've, I know that I'm better than her. I know that I'm doing things that I'm supposed to do. And as long as he had someone to look down on, he had no reason to need saving. He could have confidence in himself. 
And as we see with this woman who comes in, she, she didn't compare, she knew where she stood compared to other people. She knew she needed help. And what we find in scripture is this, until we begin to compare ourselves to God, we will never see how deep our sin is and how far we are from being the people God created us to be. That if your approach to God is, I'm going to be good enough to get to God, I'm going to work my way to God, the Bible generally has pretty bad news for you. Because the Bible says if you're going to work your way to God, if you're going to be good enough to get to God, to earn heaven, to merit a relationship with God, the standard is divine perfection. That you would be like God in everything that God is. And the normal reaction should be as you read the Bible and read about who God is and read about what he's like, unless you're just the biggest narcissist, should be to look at that picture of God and say, I'm so far away. There's so much sin in me. I've got so much work to do. I'm so much further than I thought I was. And once I take my eyes off other people and put them on Jesus and say, okay, that's the goal. The closer you get to Jesus, I think a mark of spiritual maturity is this. You realize how much further away you are. That the closer I get to Jesus, I see him more clearly and I see I'm so much less like him than I thought I would be. And again, if, if you're here this morning and your confidence is in, I am good enough that God is okay with me, Paul tells us over and over in his letters that getting to God based on your goodness is an impossibility. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Religious people, irreligious people. People who grew up in the church, people who grew up outside of the church. They've all fallen short of God's glory. Ephesians 2.1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Again, part of the problem is this, is that we think our problem is... We need to, what God wants is for us to clean ourselves up. What God wants is to get more in line with his will. And he does want us to get in line with his will. But if our hope is in, once I do that, God will be pleased with me. It puts it on me to make myself right with God. And yet the way Paul frames our problem isn't, you're just not good enough. And if you would be better, you can get to God. The problem is this, you are dead in your sin. That people can't do anything. You can't work your way back. You can't earn your way. That our hearts have, when we rejected and rebelled against God, our hearts were so hard. Our minds were, were so closed off. Our eyes so blind to the truth and the beauty of who Jesus is that the problem scripture presents isn't just work as hard as you can. Be more self-disciplined and you'll get yourself back to God. But on your own, you can't. You have no hope that it's going to require someone doing something for you. You cannot do for you to have hope of a relationship with Jesus. Daryl Bach writes about this pattern of thinking in this way because here's where it goes, that, that there are many people who've gotten to a point where it's if our love for God is cold, it may well be because we've come to think he owes it to us, not our debt is paid. And we see this in statements like, how could God do this to someone like me? We see this in things like, why isn't God giving me what I want? I'm not the kind of person this should be happening to. Because what's the assumption? I'm good enough that God should deal with me differently than he deals with everybody else. And yet when we come to Scripture and say, Scripture, define who we are. Show us our need that we're spiritually dead, that we're separated from God, that we're under his judgment, that we can't get back to him. And there are thousands of people who grew up in the church and have never confessed that reality. Have never gotten to a broken place where they said, God, I repent of my sin. And maybe that sin is, is things that we would clearly define as sin, or maybe that sin is things that we would overlook from time to time. That, that maybe that sin is simply this, I just how often I forget about God and take charge of my own life. Something that's hard to see. Maybe it's not that, that I do sinful things, but how often I condemn others for things that I've done in my heart and my mind. I'm just too worried about being respectable to follow through on it. And part of the, the charge that Jesus brings to religious people is this. Just because a sin has played out in your heart and your mind and not in the real world doesn't make it any less sinful. We read in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, you've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. 
that Jesus presses in much deeper from just actions to the attitude of our heart, the thoughts in our mind, and that as we begin to play this out, that if God is judging me not just based on the things that I've done, if God is judging me based on the things inside that no one else knows or sees, that makes me a lot more fearful to stand before God. One of the things that's so hard is this attitude that we have that I can, I can get my way back to God, I can make it work, in essence is self-righteousness, and it is sin, but it's sin that's hard to see. It's sin that Spurgeon said self-righteousness is sin in a respectable black coat. That it's still sin, but it, nothing looks wrong with it. And yet some of us are sitting here this morning and the, the reality is we are in a place where we haven't come to Jesus, we haven't confessed our sin, we haven't asked for help because deep down we really stu- still do believe this is on me to make it work, to, to, to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And yet the bad news of that is you're trying to accomplish something you cannot accomplish. You've been spinning your wheels for years. But the good news in that, it's been a lot of bad news today. All right, the good news in that is that's the place you have to get to finally respond to Jesus. You have to see your sin. You have to repent of sin. And when you do, though, what you see is, what you find is, because the fear is, if I let Jesus see who I am, he's going to push me away. And the reality from Scripture is, it's when you finally see who you are that Jesus can receive you. Because you've been the one keeping him away. And so as we we finally uh, confess who we are, what do we find? Verse 50, he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Again, her faith, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of saving. Jesus, come and, and save me. That you have this woman who for years of her life has clearly been in sin, clearly been out of step with God's will. And in a moment, what does Jesus say to her? You are saved. You're forgiven. That Jesus wipes the slate clean in that moment. Why? Because she was able to confess, Jesus, I need you. I need help. I need your death on the cross for my sin where you went and took the judgment of God I deserved. I need your perfect sinless life that I could never live. I need credit for that, what you're offering me. I need your resurrection so that I have hope for life after this. And again, for so many people, what will keep them from experiencing life with God is not Sin as we think of sin, it's self-righteousness that keeps us from being willing to admit, I am worse than I think I am. I am more evil and sinful than I think I am, and I'm in need of a Savior. As we get ready to sing, we're left with this reality. If you want your love for Jesus to grow, and I know so many of you I've talked to have just said it feels cold and forced, and I don't know why, and there are seasons where that comes. But the main thing that's going to fuel your love for God is not going to be finding a new church, is not going to be a new study you're a part of, is not going to be a new Bible reading plan or a book that you find or a sermon you hear online. Those things will help, but what's going to fuel your love for Jesus is simply this. When you see yourself as a sinner, the sinner that we all are, and when you see the judgment from God that we rightly deserved, And when you see the lengths and the cost and the price that Jesus paid to save us from that through his death, through giving his life, through giving himself for us out of his love for us, and that our debt was paid and that the slate has been wiped clean, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is, no one will have to guilt you into loving Jesus. No one will have to force it. No one will have to push you into it because it will just come out of you. And if every day of your life you keep before you this idea, I was a sinner, I was dead in my sin, and Jesus saved me, and I'm right with God because of what Jesus has done, and I do not deserve this. You will worship and read and serve and sing and love, and it will just come out of you. There will be a life change in you that can't come about in any other way. You'll begin, like this woman, to live your life for this audience of one and give yourself to Jesus in ways that doesn't make sense to the people around you because for the first time you've experienced and accepted and received the gospel that you've heard about and talked about but haven't believed yet. I'm going to pray. We'll sing, Father, thank you so much for this morning. God, I love this text. 
I love the hope that it gives us that we can never be so far from you we can't come back. And God, I thank you for the conviction and the correction you bring to religious people like me who put their hope and confidence in themselves but have never taken an honest look at their sin. I thank you that you saved both. I pray your spirit is at work in this, in this room this morning to save both, that God, for the first time today, there might be some people who have been here for years, but they repent and believe today. Father, we love you. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for all the good gifts you've given us, and we ask this all in your son's name. Amen.